so uh, maybe we should get started with, I'll tell you the order. So it'll be the Riesling, the Chardonnay, the Cab Franc and the Meritage, just so you have your wines prepared. And uh, I don't, uh, you have a plastic glass just because you will try the wine in the glass and in a plastic glass, and you will see the difference uh, in, the, in the flavor and the aroma. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so we'll start with the 19 Carly's Riesling. So if you want to pour that into your aromatic glass, so that's your, your, small, your small one, go ahead and pour it. And then, just, you know, have that in your glass. And then Diana, if you want to go ahead and start and just talk a little bit overall about the glasses, and I think she's frozen. Sure. Happy oh, to. So, so thank you, Damn. Ricky. Can you hear okay. me? Can yep. we? Yes. Um, so as Vicky mentioned, um, I'm with Fortessa Tableware Solutions, and uh, we are equity partners with Schatzwiesel. Schatzwiesel has been producing glass for about 150 years out of Germany now, so a leading manufacturer in glassware um, for the food service industry. So why that's important is obviously we've developed our glass um, and marketed to restaurants, hotels, wineries, et cetera, because of you know the the quality of the glass um and you know i mean i know that people think it's break resistant but just keep in mind that it is still glass how we sort of differentiate ourselves is that um we have you know trite technology which is both the process not to get too technical but the raw material that goes into making it and what we do is we essentially remove the lead component and replace it with titanium so titanium gives it better clear what Clarity, wear washing, brilliance, um, and strength, obviously. So these are all dishwasher safe, tempered at all the junction points, and they have a very seamless sort of uh, production. So you won't feel any joints at the stem or the base or the bowl. So um, beautiful glasses, and uh, they're tempered, obviously, and laser cut at the rim, which is important because you obviously want the wine to be placed at the right areas of the mouth. Um, the, the glass itself is a thinner construction and that's obviously important for temperature as well. So temperature control. Um, but yeah, so Pure is designed. I don't know how detailed you want me to get into the actual line, but are we talking glass now specifically or? So the idea with, you know, the Pure is, you know, a tapered um, opening um, and it's more narrow. Uh, than the bowl because it sort of traps the aroma, the tasting experience. So um, I don't know if we want to go ahead and, and try the wine. How did you want to proceed? Uh, yeah, so do you, yeah, we can, do you want to talk a little bit more about it or do you want to do one glass at a time? Uh, we can do one glass at a time or yeah. I just do an overall and then if you yeah. have any questions. So yeah. with, uh, the more, you know, obviously, um, larger bowls, so the larger base bowls, which is, you know, your Chardonnays or your, that type of thing. Um, you get, uh, you know, a better wide angled bowl. It's perfect for swirling, uh, creates more surface area to encourage sort of the aeration um, in the wine. Uh, the longer stem obviously helps maintain the temperature of the wine itself and the body heat um, from the hand. Um, the, uh, the elongated sort of, uh, more narrow glass, if you will, um, obviously lets the, you know, the, the, the wine itself, uh, oxidate. So you have, you know, better aeration. It goes more to the nose. So I don't know if you want me to add anything to that. So, so I think, I think, so we have some requests, so maybe we'll go into a little bit more detail with each glass as we go along. I think that's okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So then why don't we, we, everybody, I hope you're all tasting the reason already. This is the 2019 Carly's Block Reason from Taz. Uh, why don't we have Paul and Jess talk, talk about the wine and a little bit about the vineyard and just details about uh, what, what you're drinking. Um, well, thank you so much, everybody, for showing up today. It's a beautiful Sunday, so uh, thank you for taking the time to share it with us. Um, I'm very excited to uh, be able to talk a bit about the Carly's Block Riesling. 
It is um, one of my favorite Rieslings that we make. And um, it is dear to my heart. It was, it was the very first wine that I got to make at Taz back in 2006 when I was uh, still a student and taking over. Young. Wine. And um, it's uh, the <laughs> oldest block of uh, grapes that we have, over 40 years old now. And um, we have one acre of this property sitting on uh, just below the winery on a beautiful slope beautiful old vines that really give this wonderful kind of lean acid driven wine year in year out. Uh, 2019 was a cool wet year, the kind of year that really lends itself well towards um, making phenomenal uh, mineral driven regions. Got a great backbone of acid and a really nice uh, little bit of residual sugar left over to help to round that out. And I think, uh, showing beautifully right now and this glass makes it shine even more. Just do you have anything to add about the wine? Um, so yeah, Carly's would have been uh, fermented on the cooler side in stainless steel just to retain um, those aromatics. And I think Paul kind of nailed everything on on the uh, on the vineyard side and the winemaking side. Um, our Rieslings are um, usually lower alcohol and we give a little bit of residual sugar just to balance out that acidity and Carly's even though the vines are quite old it still retains that really crisp acidity so that sugar can kind of help to round that out a little bit. Okay there's a question about what the residual sugar is on the uh, Carly's. It would be about 35 grams. Which sounds like a lot it, it, when you when you put in the acidity. So how much acid? Because the acid and the sugar will balance each other out. Mm -hmm. uh, so what would the acid be? And maybe explain that a little bit. Yeah. So um, the pH of the wine is only two point seven. So if you think of that on a scale of um, um, on the pH scale, it's quite acidic actually. And the um, total acidity is 11.7. So quite high, actually closer to a sparkling wine nearly. So if you were to drink it on its own, it would be very searing and um, mo more than crisp. So that that residual sugar really helps to um, soften it. I, I think so there's another I... question. Sorry, go ahead, Paul. Well, I think when I taste this wine, I don't taste 35 grams of sugar. I feel that, you know, there's a nice sweet attack on the palate when it goes in. But when you swallow, you end on the acidity and you're salivating and looking forward to that next sip. And I think that's the, the balance that we always strive for at Taz with the reasons where it's instantly delicious and inviting because of the and sugar, but it's on the acid. Mm -hmm. and, and with that, um, we want it to be balanced in a way that you're not thinking about the acid or the sugar, or is it sweet? Is it overly dry? We just want the balance to be so harmonious that you're really just thinking about um, the flavors and the minerality coming through. Exactly. Yeah. There is a question about how long it'll age. Carly's is a good one for, for me. I, I, I've never tasted a Carly's. That's been past its time. I really enjoy older Rieslings. So um, yeah, we tasted the 2007 about a year ago, I want to say, and it was honestly at its prime, I think. So a good amount of time for me. Yes, we're getting a couple of questions about food parents too. Mm. Just, to, what, just, to, just to kind of final, go back to the aging for a little bit, but Riesling is a, is a variety that will age so you know especially if it's a well-made Riesling so go ahead and lay some down in your cellar and it, it, it really changes in a really interesting and pleasant way uh, complex way but you know you just you won't you don't want to put down all white wines but Riesling is one of them that you definitely can and I find Carly's um going back to not having tasted one that's been past its prime and if you if you look at that um the acidity like anything with the acidity that's as high as Carly's will age forever because um even if you look at it 
on, um, you know, an expiration point of view, something with um, a really good acidic backbone will age for a very long time. So absolutely. Yeah. Something with lots of acidity, but also a lot of fruit characters at the, at the start, so some nice um, primary aromatic fruits, and then those will change nicely too. So we'll do your, yeah. Yeah. So food pairing. So Paul, what's your favorite thing to, get, to uh, eat when you're drinking Riesling? I happen to like reason with um, blue cheese, um, strong kind of runny cheeses. I think Riesling is great because the acidity cuts the fat, um, pairs well with the kind of pungent nature of the uh, cheese. Um, mm. I, I would also eat it or drink it with uh, charcuterie. I think charcuterie and Riesling is fantastic. Any kind of umami, spicy meats, um, those go fantastic with Riesling for me. Yeah. What about you, Jess? I'm, I'm on board with anything charcuterie, like cheese or anything like that, even something fattier, like if you're thinking about fried chicken or something like that would pair really well. And um, Riesling is actually a great one for Asian cuisine as well, because I find it's kind of difficult to yes. pair with those spices. But when you get something um, a little bit fattier or something with like coconut milk or something like that, it really pairs really well. Mm. I love it with pad thai. Yeah. So good with pad thai. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a uh -oh, question about how many bottles we would get off that one acre vineyard of Carly's. It, it has ranged over the last 20 years from anywhere from just over 1,200 bottles up to, I think, um, 2013 might have been one of our biggest vintages where we got I think maybe close to 3,000 bottles on that. It's a small volume every year. Um, and, um, but I would say we would average maybe just under 2,000 bottles a year. Yeah, so the 19, um, we bottled about 2,500 bottles and that's probably about the average, 2,000, 2,500. Okay. Uh, okay, so has everybody tasted it? Uh, go ahead and, and give it a good smell and uh, taste it. And uh, oh, I think I might be frozen. No, nope. okay. you're good. You're good. Uh, here? Okay, everybody else is frozen. Uh, and then just kind of any more questions about the wine? Uh, any comments? And then maybe Diana, can you speak specifically to this glass? and why it's so great for the Riesling. Sorry, I lost you for a moment there. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Hello? Yep. <laughs> yeah, Diana, you just want to speak, speak to the, this glass specifically and why hear? it's so great with the Riesling. I think we keep losing her. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Yep. Yeah. Well, then. Uh, Diana, if you're having connection issues, oh, she's gone. Okay. <laughs> when she comes back, we'll tell her that to turn her video off. If she's having connection issues. Okay. See, so, yeah, I'm fine. Everybody else is really good. Any questions or comments about the Carleys? So uh, until we get Diana back, uh, the aromatic glasses are always a lot more narrow. They don't need as much oxygen exposure to kind of like a, a, um, a burgundy, like a Chardonnay or a Pinot would would um, would need for that uh, 
aeration. So, and also the shape of the glass kind of directs where the wine is going to hit your tongue. So it kind of hits the middle, uh, middle of your tongue where your sweet spot is. So that's a lot of the reason why for the shape. Also it directs the, the aromas up your nose. So uh, the science behind the shape of the glass has all to do with your tasting experience. As well as, as Diana said, you always hold by the stem and whatnot. So, uh, somebody asked why we have a plastic glass. We just want to so taste the wine in the glass, in your proper glass, and then taste a little bit more of the reasoning in the plastic glass and, and see, see what the difference is. And I think, Jen, somebody did comment on that one, didn't they, what they say? So, yeah, you're right, Blair. You're right. It does taste flat in the plastic glass, because um, it does. You know, plastic is, does not. The, the wine just doesn't work well in the plastic, and then it doesn't have that same uh, shape and the aromatic abilities. Uh, yeah. So, has everybody else tried that yet? We're getting some comments that Taz has the best Rieslings in Niagara. <laughs> we do. Uh, so for a rosé, I would also use an aromatic glass myself because it is an aromatic wine. Uh, you want to have that same kind of uh, experience. Yeah, very flat and flabby, you're right. Um, so Elizabeth is asking if we can speak to the different blocks for the white wine. So are you, are you referring to the like Carly's? Riesling, uh, um, Robbins, uh, is, that, is that what you're asking about? Maybe Paul, talk about the different vineyard blocks? Okay, is he there? Uh, yeah, Paul's frozen too. No. Jess, do you want to do that? <laughs> talk about our different vineyard blocks? Yeah, gotta unmute. You're on mute. You're on mute. Everyone's dropping out here. Um, so the question is, can you speak to different blocks of white wine? Um, just overall or anything anything specific throughout the blocks at Taz or? Yeah, I think just about the different vineyard blocks. So we have Carly's block, Robin's block, David's block. Yeah, so um, Carly's block um, is one of our oldest plantings. So is it? in the 70s, I believe it's about 40 years old. Um, and then Robin's block was planted a little bit later, I think in the mid 80s, we've got Chardonnay and um, a tiny little bit of Pinot, less than an acre of Pinot, I believe in Robin's block. Um, and that goes towards our Cherry Avenue Pinot. Um, and then we've got David's block as well. So David's block is up around the back of the winery and we have uh, reds planted in David's. So we have Cab Franc a little bit, of Gamay now as well, we just recently planted, and um, actually a little bit of Chardonnay that we pull for our sparkling uh, Chardonnay. So soils are clay loam. Um, yeah, and the, um, I don't know. They're named, they're named oh, one of the questions, they're named after the Taz children. So Rob and David ah, right. are the, uh, the children of Maureen and Joanne Taz. Uh, yeah. And the Maury bought this original property in Paul ninety nine. I'm sorry, I was I lost you guys there for a second. Um, and was it was question? Paul Maury purchased this property in nineteen ninety nine or two thousand. He purchased the property, yeah, and then made the first in two thousand and one. So we've got twenty years worth of vintages now. Yeah. Yes, it's our 20th anniversary. Uh, just kind of going through some of the other questions. You could use this type of glass for anything aromatic. Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Gris, Gewürztraminer, Rosé. So anything, just um, just not, I just wouldn't use it for oaked wine. Um, best serving temp for Riesling is around, it's uh, 10 degrees, 10 to 12 degrees, give or take. Uh, you want it a little bit chill, uh, more chill than you would uh, a Chardonnay. Um, and there was one other question that I wanted to answer. <laughs> Where we go? <laughs> Trying to read the questions. Um, yeah, 
There's that one was... question about cross pollination. If that's an issue. Oh yeah. Varietals. It's not an issue um, because grape varieties are um, grapes are self pollinating. The flower of the grape is both male and female, so um, there is no uh, cross pollination that happens. They uh, pollinate themselves, so there's no need for bees or any other insects in order to uh, pollinate grapes. All right. Um, since Diana's not here, they, there's some questions about what happens when you pour it into the burgundy, um, mm. what the difference is. And I think just because it's such a big glass and it's so wide and open, you don't have that narrowing that sends the aromas directly into your nose. And it also hits your palate in a different spot. So it will change the flavor of the wines. It's also about the oxygen exposure. You don't want too much uh, oxygen exposure to aromatic wines, because uh, then they lose their freshness. So with where with a wine that's been in an oak, you do put it up with some some oxygen and aerate it a little bit. So that's that's the main reason for those um, that uh, that shape. Uh, yes, Lena, you can still buy more. We always carry all these wines, both, both properties. So um, no problem. Should we move on to the next wine? <laughs> <laughs> been on Riesling for a while. So everybody had a chance to try the Riesling in the proper glass. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and try the Chardonnay. So now you're going to uh, get your Burgundy glass. Uh, it's the nice big fat one. Uh, we use this, well here at Taz, we use it for both the Chardonnay and the Pinot Noir, the, the Burgundies. Um, over at Redstone, we do have a Beaujolais glass. Is everything. Uh, in addition to, but um, why start with the sweet wine dry before sweet? Well, because, uh, <laughs> sorry, I just reading, just finished my fourth glass. Good job. <laughs> uh, we, can, we can do the Riesling before the Chardonnay because it is, even though it does have the re res residual sugar, it has a lot of acidity. So it's not it's not like trying a Gewürztraminer before a Chardonnay because a Gewürztraminer a lot less acid, it's a lot more viscous, and it would really hang around in your taste buds where the Riesling is not going to do that. So um, we often pour a Riesling before a Chardonnay. So. Okay, so we're moving on to the 2019 Robbins Block Chardonnay. So Jess and Paul, tell us about this one. So the Robbins Block comes from a small, um, block in front of Ta is about four acres, I believe, Paul, four acres. Um, and same as I was saying before, clay loam soil. Um, Robins, I find, is one of our more like luscious and opulent Chardonnays. So um, when we ferment it, we, we press it and ferment it into barrel. Um, we almost always do a wild fermentation on our Robins block Chardonnay um, just to hopefully get um, more complexity in the wine. Um, also to let the, the minerality and all of the natural fruit, fruit flavors show. Um, we would have picked Robins in mid-October. So 2019 was actually quite a cool vintage. We started rather late. Um, and actually I, I missed that entire vintage. So, um, but, but yeah, so we started picking um, a couple weeks after I went away on mat leave and uh, yeah, 12 months in French oak, would have spent probably close to six months in stainless steel before we bottled it. If I can share a little story about this vineyard too. Um, back in 99, Maury uh, Taz, who owns Taz, was considering starting a winery, um, but he wanted to start it in Burgundy. And um, he had been a big lover of Burgundy. Um, and he was at a wine tasting event and put a glass of Chardonnay in his hand blind and had him taste it. And he was completely blown away by it. And it was a uh, Temkin Pascus uh, Chardonnay, I think 97 maybe. And um, he was so blown away. He thought, why am I going to Burgundy to start a winery when we can make this kind of world-class Chardonnay in my backyard. And after the tasting, he basically came down to Niagara the, the next couple of weeks 
and started looking for vineyard properties. And one of the first properties he saw that he liked was the Robin's Block Chardonnay. And he purchased that, and then that was the birth of Oz Winery back in uh, 2000. Uh, yep, You're on and, and the rest is history. <laughs> so there was a question about um, uh, the different flavor profile between the different vineyard blocks. And so uh, just kind of, you kind of touched on the, the different soils, but uh, Paul, do you want to talk more, oh, if you're there, talk more about the other differences in the vineyard blocks? You know, what kind of makes up the terroir, the different vineyard blocks? Yeah, so I think um, as just kind of the clay loams. They lost him. <laughs> yep. It's he, that sun, Sunday Wi-Fi. Yes. Sunday Wi-Fi. Sunday cottage Wi-Fi. <laughs> you can turn your, ca your camera off, Paul. It might give you a little Maybe bit. better might give you a bit of a boost. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yeah, totally. Can hear you now. So um, the Robin's block, the heavy clay um, silt really allows the wine to be a little richer, rounder. And then our other uh, single vineyard for top is the Quarry Road, which is um, chock full of limestone and really allows us to make wines that have a little more leaner mineral uh, flinty note that uh, more reminiscent of Burgundy than uh, say the Robin's block, which is a little bit more of a lobster wine. Mm -hmm. Yum. <laughs> lobster and onion. Yum. Uh, there was a question. What is Taz's best selling wine? That's a that's a tough one because you know it, it it's not always the same. We can't just say there's one wine that always outsells all the rest. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that right now, in my opinion, Cap Franc is, is the hot ticket. Everybody wants Cap Franc right now. But, you know, the Robin's Block and the Carly's Block, they're always pretty solid. You know, they have followings. People buy them, you know, they, so it's, okay, it's a hard, it's, I don't know, Paul, do you have, like, what do you think? Like, it's hard to answer that question. Did we lose them completely? Possibly. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 not just a simple. This is the one. It changes on people's tastes and and the trends and you know the vintages. So, but right now it's Cap Franc for sure. So, uh, oh, here's a question: What are the benefits of using wild yeast as opposed to commercial? Does it depend on the wine or the vintage? Yes. Um, for us, it does a little bit depend on the wine or the vintage. Um, we try to do all of our Chardonnays as often as possible with wild yeast. Um, I think the advantages of using wild yeast are, I mean, widely debatable. But um, for us, I find that the wild yeast, um, especially as we were saying, like 20 years in, we've been making Chardonnay at Taz and the... Um, the um, the wild yeast kind of lends a complexity and um, commercial yeast, I mean, you it's, it's selected and recommended um, specifically for varietals and a certain style of wine. So you can kind of go shopping um, for ingredients uh, for yeast and kind of pick like, okay, this, this says that it's going to be recommended for a cooler fermentation, aromatics of pineapple and banana, um, that kind of thing. So you can kind of select a yeast um, to help make the wine be exactly what you're looking for. Um, so wild yeast is a bit of a wild card. You don't exactly know what you're going to get, um, but if you can if you can build a, a strong, happy wild yeast culture, um, it can it can end up being quite complex and help uh, help show the fruit as it sort of should be. So um, you might end up with something, you know, simple and, and lean, or you might end up with something um, really complex and, and different. And I think that um, after, after doing so many 
Chardonnay ferments at, at Taz with wild uh, fermentations. We find, you know, that um, very Taz flavor of like white flour and stone fruit and those kinds of aromatics. And I think that the wild yeast lends itself well to that. We have a couple of oak questions too. Um, talking about oak influence, uh, what aromas and flavors it brings, and also what kind of barrels we use. Um, for Chardonnay, we, well, actually for all of our wines, we use 100% French oak between Taz and for Redstone. Um, we mostly for Chardonnay use um, a blend of 500 liter barrels and 228 liter French oak barrels. Um, and we use two different coopers. So um, a cooper is a, a um, person or company who uh, creates the barrel. So they, they literally um, bring in the wood and create the staves and do the toasting or smoking or anything that you're looking for in house. Um, so the two different coopers we use are usually Caduce and Mercury for our Chardonnay. Um, and you can get you can get different kinds of toast levels. Um, we usually try to err on the side of a leaner style of barrel, um, less toast, less oak flavor to hopefully let the wine shine through and, and just kind of complement the wine with oak. We usually use between 20 and 30 percent um, new oak barrels each vintage. And so the rest would be um, second, third, fourth fill. So when you when you first fill them, you get kind of those, um, you can get flavors of caramel or vanilla, um, creamy, oakier flavors, sometimes uh, like a honey note. Um, and then as you fill them more often, uh, second, third, fourth, and fifth fill, uh, they sort of mellow out and you, you lose those new oak flavors um, and it, it just ends up being neutral. So the wine would just throw, show through um, as if it would in stainless steel, except you get a little bit more oxygen into the barrel, which helps it breathe and evolve and develop complexities as well. We have a long glass of our question here that I think we'll wait and hopefully Diana will be back online. Well, we can read it, read it, because we, okay. can, we can speak to um, this. Is it correct that the glass shape can be broken down into two aspects? One, the ratio between the widest and narrow diameters, and two, the distance between those two diameters. Um, what does wide versus narrow do to the wines, and what does tall versus short do to the wines? Um, how can you choose between those and have the best glass for your wine? Right, so we did, we did, we have spoke to the difference um, between the wide versus narrow. So here we've got, you know, the wide burgundy, the, the narrow um, aromatic, the wide burgundy, the main purpose is for the, the, let me just, I've got my chat screen here, is the amount of exposure, surface exposure to oxygen is because this has been, this is Chardonnay, it spent time in oak, exposing it to oxygen helps to wake up the aromas uh, and just kind of get it going. Uh, it, it benefits from oxygen exposure, of course, not for three days, but you know, it lasts uh, and it gives you lots of room to swirl. Uh, that's the main purpose for the wide. Uh, as, and as I said earlier, the narrow, the narrow glass, you don't want as much oxygen exposure for your, your aromatics. Uh, the oxygen can actually, you know, start to, to dilute the aromas and the flavors. You want to keep them fresh. So that's why it's, it's more narrow. And it's also about directing those aromas because this is aromatic. This is very, lots of, lots of smells, lots of odors coming out. And it pushes those odors up your nose because... Um, 75 to 80 percent of cases actually smell so you want you want to flood your nasal passage, passageways with this with these aromas to increase your tasting experience um, so that's this <laughs> that makes sense um, sorry can we talk more about aroma and taste absolutely we can we can do that uh, so said, uh, taste and, and smell are very, they go hand in hand. Um, if you can't smell something, you're not really going to taste it as good. 
So, hi, Diana. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Oh, welcome back. Okay. Sorry, okay. I lost call. My internet, I think there's some work down the street, so I don't even know where we're at here. Apologize. <laughs> uh, we're just, we are, we have tasted through the Chardonnay, and we just have a bunch of questions about the glassware. So, I just okay. spoke to the shape of the two again and, and about okay. the oxygen exposure and whatnot. So, the, the main question was the difference between the tall and the narrow, or the, the tall and the short and the wide and the narrow. So right. uh, if you want to maybe just uh, sure. put your input, yeah. input into that. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, based on, on what I've been trained is the, you know, the generally the longer the neck, um, like the broader the bowl, um, it's generally designed for full bodied reds or Sauvignons. And it, it sort of, you know, directs the wine to the back of the mouth. Um, they need more oxygen, so it just it helps develop sort of the aromatic properties um, in the taller stem. So the larger bowl um, and the design behind the pure is that, you know, obviously the, the, the swirling itself, um, the wide angled swirl um, or the wide angled bowl is perfect for swirling and creates more, you know, surface area to encourage sort of aeration within the, the wine itself. Um, so it's more nose forward, in my opinion, and it allows you to sort of smell the wine. Um, whereas, you know, the more elongated is, is more in, in terms of, you know, developing, you know, the wine flavors themselves. Mm -hmm. If that helps, does that help at all? Yeah. So, yes. Um, Karen, you said, I often have been using this glass for my cab, so am I using the wrong glass? Are you talking about the Chardonnay glass? Uh, if so, yeah, I think that the capsule will do better in the uh, Bordeaux glass, which we'll finish with. Um, it's, yeah. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, if you have a favorite glass, use your favorite glass. But uh, definitely some wines will taste better in others for sure. Mm -hmm. So um, have we tried the Chardonnay in the glass and then tried it in the plastic cup again? Do you see any differences? Um, oh yeah, can you talk about nose and flavor? Okay, absolutely, Kim. I'm just trying to specifically, I'm, uh, well, I'm not sure what you want <laughs> me to talk about. So the nose is, you know, um, the, the, the aromas that come off the wine. So there are different levels of aromas. There's the primary. So when a wine is younger, uh, you're going to get more of a fresh fruit, uh, you know, maybe floral characteristic. Uh, as it gets older, then those characteristics change, and then you move into like primary and secondary aromas, uh, or sorry, secondary and tertiary aromas. Uh, and the different, there's a couple different types of aromas that you you will smell too. And one is the grape influence, and one is the winemaking influence. So. Uh, for, you know, for example, the Chardonnay is perfect, perfect for that because we can smell those tropical fruits. You know, I'm getting mango and I'm getting banana. And that's coming from the grape. That's coming from the Chardonnay. But I'm also getting that a little bit of a toasted vanilla smell. And that's coming from the winemaking. That's coming from the barrel. So there's some different, um, different influencing factors on what you're smelling. And then going through and then tasting it, you know, it's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> uh, I think you get, my opinion, and you know, feel free to jump in guys, uh, more of the great char characteristics when I think it was in, on the palate, on the you know? Yeah. yeah. So did that, did that answer your question a little bit? Um, was it Karen that you asked that? I'm just trying. <laughs> Uh, Ray, we're going to use the, the Chardonnay glass for, you would use a Chardonnay glass for Pinot because this is a burgundy glass, so it covers both Chardonnay and Pinot because they, they benefit in the same way from the glass. Uh, other wines, you can drink, uh, I would drink uh, Beaujolais in these glasses. Mm -hmm. um, I actually if you really like drinking Syrah out of it as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, Gamay, or uh, if you have an Oak Sauvignon Blanc, anything that's spent some time in barrel, I would definitely um, 
but lighter. You don't want to go into your heavy red. This one. You want to keep those for the uh, other classes. So yeah, we had some. Jen, we had some comments about the one people. Uh, yeah, we've got uh, a lot of people tasting it in the plastic, so it's very bland. Mm -hmm. um, not really tasting much. Um, yeah. And then there was the question about the nose and the flavors. Yeah. Um, and then over here. Um, yeah, the Pinot Noir and what other ones? Yeah. All right. So um, we could do something interesting and we can try the Chardonnay in the raisin glass if you want. You know, if you want to do that, or we can move on to the next one. Because <laughs> yeah. it's really interesting too, because it does, you will notice a difference in aromas. Uh, tasting the Chardonnay in the aromatic glass, so, yeah. I'm trying to get a little more aroma from it, but there's less flavor when you try it in the reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the palate comes out a little, um, a little flatter. Uh, rec glass recommendation for the Gamay, yeah, yeah, you can use the burgundy glass or don't carry a Beaujolais glass, which is very similar to this, but just a little bit smaller. Um, yeah, but you can use a Gamay in the, in the Burgundy class. No problem. Okay, so let's, why don't we move on to our next wine? So next, you're ready for the next wine? Perfect, Peter. <laughs> so next we're going to move on to Redstone. So we've done our two Taws wines, now we're moving on to Redstone. So it's the uh, Redstone Vineyard Cap Franc. So um, yeah, go ahead and pour it into your Cab Merlot glass. So the smaller of the two uh, heavy red glasses. So, uh, and uh, Jess, what can you tell us about the Redstone? The Redstone. Sorry, I'm on mute. Um, the Redstone Cab Franc from 2017. So 2017, um, again, was a more mild vintage. Um, sometimes in those milder vintages, you get much um, more lighter and juicier aromatics. Um, the wine would have been picked in uh, mid-November. So that's quite, quite late for picking uh, reds and we would have just let it uh, hold on on the vine for a bit longer to try and get some of those nicer juicier fruit flavors. Uh, the wine would have been uh, fermented in large um, large oak fermenters and probably close to two to three weeks on the skins just to get that really nice um, dark color and, and good flavors from the wine, good extraction. Uh, and then all of our, um, all of our Bordeaux bridles um, and uh, Cab Franc are aged for 18 months in French oak. So just to, um, just to try and develop those flavors, soften the tannins, um, not have such a, um, such a tightly wound and tannic uh, red wine. So, so the barrels will kind of complement the wine in the way of softening. So we're not actually looking to get as much oak influence as we are to just address, um, address the, um, the tannins in the wine, so. Excellent. Uh, do you want to explain what BQA 20 mile bench means? Mm. Yep, so um, BQA 20 mile bench. Ah, so on the on the Riesling and the Chardonnay, they're both a uh, 20 mile bench. So BQA actually has, uh, is it, I'm not sure how many Appalachians in Niagara anymore, maybe 10? 13, 13, I think, between 13 10 and 15. And VQA starts, VQA starts for Vintners Quality Alliance. Yeah, so um, the VQA is a, a regulatory body in uh, Canada, mm -hmm. and VQAO is for uh, Vintners Quality Alliance of Ontario. Uh, the different appellations are the different kind of uh, regions throughout Niagara. So we've got the Niagara region, which is a grape growing region. And then we have um, all of the sub appellations, which would be, um, you know, ours would be uh, 
20 mile bench, Fine Mount Ridge, Redstone is on the Lincoln Lake shore. Mm -hmm. And all of those different areas have um, different smaller climates, especially being on the escarpment. We have so many different microclimates throughout the Niagara region. So up on the top of the escarpment, it's cooler. Um, down, down the slope and towards Lake Ontario, it's a little bit warmer. You get more, um, more airflow from the from the lake. And so, uh, and then also the soils are are very different throughout mm -hmm. all of Niagara as well. So um, they're kind of categorized between those different regions. Um, it's not a quality thing. It's just more that the wines from each region will be very different from from the climate uh, influence and from from the soil influence. So Todd's is located on the uh, 20 mile bench and Redstone is located on the Lincoln Lake Shore. Excellent, which which is a good segue into one of the questions that we have from Aaron. It's what's the relationship between Todd's and Redstone? So uh, Todd's and Redstone, we're, we're sister property. So Maury Todd's owns both companies both wineries and Jess and Paul are the winemakers are for both wineries. We have, we share the same winemaking team. So the people that are bringing you your Taz wines are also bringing you your Redstone wines. Thanks Jess, good job. <laughs> uh, so Redstone opened about five years ago to the public. Huh? And um, yeah, just slightly different profiles where, you know, uh, Redstone's a little bit more focused on uh, Bordeaux uh, Red Taz has more Burgundian influence. So yeah, but it's completely separate, legally separate wineries, but um, all one big happy family. <laughs> um, there was, so Jess, going, um, speaking of the 17 vintage, it was that warm September and October that really saved the vintage, didn't it? Because wasn't there some yeah, some yes. fear throughout? Yeah. <laughs> 2017 was a spooky yeah. um, was a spooky summer just because it was cool, it was wet, um, not much room for ripening when it's so cool and wet through the whole season. Um, but we actually were saved in in the fall because the fall months actually ended up being not ex not extraordinarily warm, but unseasonably warm and unseasonably dry. So. Um, I, I've been in the wine industry in Niagara for about 13 years, and I want to say like most autumns uh, are actually quite wet and usually on the cooler side. So 2017, we got really, really lucky, and um, and that and that um, fall season really pulled us through. You need you need the sun and the warmth um, for ripening ripening the grapes and if you if you don't have it then you end up with like greener fruit and uh lower brixes so lower alcohol wines um more green flavors so we we were lucky that year i 100 percent agree just that uh, september saved uh, 2017 we um could not have made great wines without that warm september um i don't think we're picking until almost october 1st that year and uh I think on September 28th or 29th, I ended up spending the day at the beach um, at 50 Point and uh, we swam all day, it was so warm. And then we started harvest the very next day. Mm -hmm. What do you feel about the aromas and flavors of the wine, Jess? I think um, for the for the tw 2017, um, going into it, I would have thought, you know, greener flavors, um, like really crisp acidity, but it's actually quite round and really, really soft and jammy. I love our temp punk. I think it's the move. My <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, just, it's nicely know. balanced. The acid is, is really subtle. I think the oak is subtle too. And, and those, um, red, red fruit flavors really shine through. Yeah. Uh, Another thing about redstone is the, um, the soil there is a heavy red clay. So that, um, that vineyard is a good spot for reds because that red clay kind of helps uh, retain the heat. Um, so we can do more Bordeaux varietals um, and they have a little bit more room 
to um, to ripen throughout the year just because it's a nice warm spot. Yeah. And I think we had to be very, very patient in 2017. We um, didn't get these grapes until mid-November. So we sat and waited and waited and if I'm not mistaken, all the leaves had fallen off and then we went out to pick the grapes. Totally, yeah. yeah. But I do think we managed to get some nice ripeness out of the wine that year. We did, yeah. Diana, do you want to speak uh, about the, the, the glass and, uh, you know, a bit more about the shape of it? And um... So, yeah, I think with, um, you know, I mean, with this particular glass, um, I think it, it really sort of displays the more um, aromatic reds. Um, they generally need, you know, a little bit more oxygen exchange. And I think that's why, you know, you've got a longer neck here and then a tapered um, which allows for, you know, uh, like a trapping aromas in a very sort of targeted way. Um, so these, it's displays beautifully in here. I just actually drank it in the burgundy and it's, it's very flat, very, very flat in my opinion. I just tried it in the plastic as well and you just yeah, get that alcohol that yeah. kind of burn off of it and you don't really get <laughs> a lot of flavor. Yeah. Kim says it's absolutely disgusting in plastic. <laughs> Question from uh, Cindy is, what's the best way to drop, wash, wash and dry the glasses? Wash and dry. These are all dishwasher safe, so they can go into your dishwasher. Um, drying, so with glasses, generally like a crystal glass, um, once it's heated in a high temp dishwasher, it needs to allow to cool. So you need to get to room temperature before polishing because that's when the molecules are most active. And I know that's not ideal because you obviously want to polish before the spots form, um, but just allow it to cool a little bit more to room temperature before you start sort of torquing at the stem and the base. Uh, but these are all dishwasher safe, so they're fine. I mean, we've had over 2000, you know, wear washing tests, tests with these. So they, they really are, you know, ideal for home use and restaurant use. As someone who polishes a lot of them, the other thing is you don't want to hold it at the bottom and twist at the top. You want to yeah. sort of, I hold use it. two cloths, one on the bottom, yes. one on the top, and exactly. it's a lot smoother yeah. rather than twisting that stem because that's going to put a lot of pressure yeah. as it's not necessary. Thank one thing I would, I would recommend though, if you are, if yes, these ones don't fit in your dishwasher, uh, but if you are putting them in your dishwasher at home, mm -hmm. I rinse them before you dry them or rinse them before you use them. Uh, the dishwashers you have at home, the, the, the soap will leave a residue on the glasses. I, wa I hand wash all of my wine glasses um, just because of that dishwasher residue. Um, and then polishing cloth, you want to use a, a wine lint glass free. lint free. Mm -hmm. um, we sell them here and that's all we use because if you it's just a regular tea towel, you're going to get covered in, in lint. So a lint-free polishing cloth. Um, yeah, so somebody, yeah. Yes, sorry. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's a, I think it's a consumer preference, whether you want to hand wash or dishwasher, you know, or put it in the dishwasher. But you can lay these on an angle on the top rack. Um, they will come out beautifully. Like, even though the stem is, you know, obviously pure is a very high stem, um, but I mean, it's, you know, entirely the consumer's preference, but Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, just give them a rinse before you. Yes, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Jess and Paul, there's a question for you about the, the shape of the Riesling and the Chardonnay glasses. So the Burgundy bottle versus mm -hmm. the Hawk bottle. Is there a reason? I think Paul maybe isn't there. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we chose um, we chose these bottles um, just mostly out of tradition. So traditionally, Riesling is um, in this thinner, taller uh, hawk bottle. So um, Riesling out of Al Alsace or out of Germany. Um, the burgundy-shaped bottle, again, um, uh, most burgundies are, are bottled in in the uh, burgundy shape and and same with wines from you know the Rhone or um, yeah it's it's more of a common uh, shape bottle um, I don't 
I, I might be wrong in this one, but I don't know if there's anything to do with, um, you know, aging the wine or anything like that. It's more just um, the aesthetic. Uh, I think that I do. I think that the uh, and I could be wrong. The Bordeaux bottles, the Bordeaux bottle, has the longer neck um, because these uh -huh. will tend to spend more time in the cellar. And if you are, you know, if you are putting away for a long time some some very expensive, fancy wines, uh, you might candle it to decant. So candling is a process of pouring the wine out. Uh, using a candle so you can see when the, you get to the sediment. So I think that might be a reason for yeah. the water on the Yeah, and the shoulders kind of can catch the sediment as you're pouring it out instead of just letting them slide right on out. But um, but mm. you'll find many, many Chardonnays and, and Rieslings, other aromatics are often, um, they, they wouldn't have any sediment, so. We have a couple Diana questions as well. Um, First one was from Simon, and he wanted to know how the glass production compares with from shot Stiesel to Riedel. Are they similar production? Um, I don't generally speak about you know the competition. We speak you know about our glass and our performance. Yeah. Um, Riedel makes a beautiful glass. I mean, they're blown a little bit thinner. Um, we tend to blow ours just you know slightly, a little bit more thick. Um, but it's still, you know, thin enough that it displays the wine and the temperature properly. Um, essentially, the only thing I can really say to that is that, you know, Riedel was sort of designed as a residential glass and we are more, you know, hospitality focused. So, you know, both the production process and the raw ingredients that go into making ours um, have proven to be a little bit stronger in my opinion. And I have sold the glass over 20 years. So um, titanium has, you know, has, uh, has proven to be a really good raw ingredient. And that's yeah. really all I can say, yeah. But the oh, is, is, I a can, beautiful glass, it's just, yeah, look, you know. For sure. Yeah, I can speak to as as because uh, Taz here we used to carry Riedel, right. uh, and Riedel has ma many different lines though. So you know, mm, it does. We have Crystal, but those are very very pricey and very fragile. And then their more basic line was just glass. Um, mm -hmm. So when we after we switched to the pure glasses, uh, these are far more durable. We mm -hmm. sell nearly as many glasses as we used to. Uh, you know, and, and you're right, we read all our beautiful glasses, but mm -hmm. these just suit our purpose between the, the, mm -hmm. the tasting bars and the restaurant. They just, they're just better for us. And it's a beautiful glass, so. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting enough, I mean, pure, generally speaking, is a much taller stem. <clears throat> so, you know, the higher the stem, the more fragile the glass, traditionally. So, you know, to be fair, if you're going to compare, you need to compare apples to apples. So, you know, a, a, you know, rounder bowl, shorter stem, that sort of thing. So this is just, you know, a, a different sort of category altogether, the pure line. So, and if it's performing better than a round, shorter stem, then, I mean, that's sort of proof in the pudding, right? So. Yep. That's actually a great transition to the next one, which is, what is the math behind the stemware design? Is there was an earlier question about the ratio between the widest part and the rim and the distance between the widest part to the rim. Um, how oh, is that's very technical. The rim? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Okay, yeah, that's a very technical question. I think, well, the design obviously and the angles were sort of, you know, implemented to allow for like perfect aeration. Um, so, you know, with a wider bowl, I mean, Traditionally, any wider bowl is designed to sort of aerate the wine and it's more nose forward. So, you know, you're able to sort of you know, sniff. You've got a wider bowl, but still a much wider base. Um, so that's that's a very technical question. And I don't know that I can get that technical. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah. Uh, Jess, there's a question for you, though. Uh, a little peppery bite on this wine due to tough ripening conditions? Or is that just the, the bridal? I think that it, it, to me, it seems nicely ripened. And I think we did end up getting there with the ripeness on the fruit. Um, 
the pepperiness could just be varietal as well. So Capronk can often give you not, um, I mean, you can get green pepper flavors. I don't really get this on this wine, but um, from Capronk, often you get like kind of a tobacco or um, or like cigar box kind of pepperiness and, and that can be varietal as well. Uh, what would you recommend for a food pairing with the cab from Jess? Oh, or Paul? A tough one. Say it again. A uh, food pairing with the cab from. I think <laughs> um, this may be a little pedestrian, this pairing, but I think uh, mm. pizza and cab franc or a burger and cab franc to me. Yeah. Uh, I was even pairing. thinking like um, like a, what do you call it? uh like a portobello mushroom kind of burger yep. yeah because it's yes. not it's not super super heavy it's more medium body so you mm -hmm. know go it'll go fine with meat but it doesn't mm -hmm. need that rich meat so yep. it pairs nicely with lighter things too i think the acid would hold up to something a little bit fattier as well mm -hmm. yeah yeah this would be nice to me it goes good. Yeah, he's he texts me. He's having a lot of problems. <laughs> he's at his cottage. <laughs> uh, Karen's doing burgers tonight to pair with the cat bronc. Awesome. Oh, here's a good question. Sorry, I'm not sure if you're going to read it, Jen. Can you share the difference between the Taz cat bronc and the Redstone cat bronc? I find a huge difference, so I'm actually really interested in this yeah. one too. Between yeah. so the um, the cab franc that we grow at Taz is from our David's block, and the cab franc at Redstone. Well, I mean we only have one one block, but um, yeah. So David's block, um, from my understanding, is a little bit older vines. Um, also, the I think in terms of the fruit, David's block always ends up being. Um, a lighter style Cab Franc, you get like those really peppery notes, um, sometimes the greener tobacco kind of flavors and uh, and red fruit like raspberries, um, cassis, like those tart red red flavors. Um, from Redstone with the, with the heavier soil, I find we often get those richer, darker, uh, like blue and blackberry um, style flavors from that. Um, and, and yeah, low, low yield then, and everything winemaking wise done very similarly. Uh, just just the fruit often at David's, I find a little bit more crisp, a little bit more green and the redstone a little bit, um, a little bit heavier. Yeah, I find it richer and a little, like you definitely have that blueberry, but you also get some of the red fruits as well. Um, yeah. Just a little more weight on the palate. Mm. Uh, here's a question for you, Jess. Is it true that agglomerated cork gives a spicy taste to the wine? I, I haven't heard that before, but um, no. maybe I'll have to do some investigating. Yeah, I don't, cork isn't supposed to influence the wine. The cork is just, a, no matter how it's made, but Jess, you'll have to look into that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe a, a, a perception of of something spicier just holding on to um you know if, you, if you're using like a, a natural cork it might let some oxygen in so it might kind of uh dull out those those um you know primary flavors like the the fruit and the spice so so maybe it's just holding on to onto those flavors less oxygen getting in but um yeah i'll have to do some research yeah, interesting Good, uh, good question. So uh, it'd be kind of interesting if you can try the Cab Franc in the other, so the Bordeaux glass that we're going to finish with. I'm just curious to see if you might not get a difference from these two, but uh, give it a try and see. Uh, I've got Meritage of mine, so I can't, but um, I don't know. I don't think so, but I'm curious. Mm -hmm. I find that aromatically there's less on the nose. You don't yeah, smell okay. as much. Because we yeah, only have the, the Bordeaux here at Taz. We've got the Cabrillo at Redstone, so I may have to bring it over here to Taz. <laughs> Flavor-wise, I think it's um, flavor. a little less flavorful, but it's still tasty. Um, but I just find there's less 
the smell. Yeah, Linda says it lost flavor. Interesting. You notice the difference, Jess? Uh, I'm just uh, working my Meritage out of this glass, so I have to come back to it. I already pre-poured yeah. my Meritage. So. <laughs> when I had to move out of the cellar, Lori prepared it for me already. So I'm just kind of, I'm going by. Diane, did you try? Are, Diane, are you trying the wines? I am, yeah. Did you notice that? <laughs> <You're supposed laughs> yes. It's uh, better than plastic. <laughs> let me just actually, I had the, the Meritage in there. So there we go. You know, I'm a little head, head of schedule here. Well, that's okay. Yeah. Lydia said it's actually better in the plastic. That is really funny. It's better in the plastic? Oh, <laughs> oh my. But then, then in the Meritage glass. Mm. I think in the Meritage glass, it loses some mm. of those red flavors. Like I think you're getting more oak spice, um, more of oh. those secondary tertiary flavors. Owen said the bite is less in the larger glass. Yeah, so probably the, the oxygen softening mm -hmm. is, bit, mm -hmm. is more exposure, travel time. Maybe, tra more travel time from the glass. Mm -hmm. The bottom too. Mm -hmm. It's a science, man. Yeah. Personally, I prefer it in the cap glass. Mm -hmm. I think it, the acidity is um, somewhat softened in the in the larger glass as well. All right. Any other questions or comments about the um, the cab there, Jen? Or nope, no more questions about the cab. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we can and, move on to the Meritage. I mean, if you really want to try something different, you can also try you know try it in the other glasses. You could try it in the Riesling and try it in the Chardonnay to really mm -hmm. see that difference because they will really. Change I tried it the burgundy and it just lost everything. I just didn't mm -hmm. find anything. But <laughs> All right. I guess uh, Emily, that's a great picture. It's good hat. James, good hat. Sorry, <laughs> somebody sent me a picture. <laughs> uh, all right. Last wine. Mm, okay. 17 Meritage. So we're going to put it in the Bordeaux glass. So the Cab Merlot glass, which is the shorter. It's the same width though, correct, Anna? Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. Circumference, yes. Yeah. So just taller. Uh, so you're going to Meritage in there. And Jess, do you want to start off by explaining to people what a Meritage is? For those yeah, who so don't Yep, a meritage is um, sort of the North American term for a Bordeaux blend. So we don't obviously have the rights to call our um, Bordeaux varietals Bordeaux because they're not from there. Um, kind of like how Champagne is exclusively from the region of Champagne. Um, so meritage is uh, the word we use for a uh, Bordeaux varietal red blend. Um, yeah. All right, and then this Meritage, the 17 Redstone Meritage is, do you have the blends on hand? I sure do. It is 60% Merlot, 20% uh, Cab Sauve, and 20% uh, Cabernet Franc. And can you, can you speak to how, because like, the, the blends change every vintage. Mm -hmm. the recipe, can you explain the process? Like how do you decide what the blend's going to be? Uh, yeah, so normally we, we teach, taste each wine as um, a single vineyard and we actually make them all as single vineyard wines as well. It's not until the final stages that um, we start tinkering and blending and we usually taste them individually and take note of the different um, the different things that each each varietal will bring to the table. I think in 2017 um, the Cab Sauve and the Cab Franc were um, a little bit um, probably more tannic and astringent on their own um, for the Meritage blend. So we ended up going with a, a good chunk of Merlot. So 60% Merlot to try and um, round that out and soften it. So I think Merlot usually has um, those red fruit characters. And I often find it really chocolatey as well. So, um, and the acidity is usually a little bit lower as well. So we we did a heavier, a heavier Merlot blend and then, um, 20% Cab Sauve 
and 20% Cab Franc just to um, add some complexity. The, the Cab Sauve would definitely have those tannins, those spicier elements, and then the Cabernet Franc would bring in the red fruit. Excellent. Uh, Karen Cleaver said that Redstone Meritage has always been a fake. It is good. This is this has amazing nose. So again, try it. You should try this wine in the Merlot glass as well. Diana, there's a question for you. Uh, what glass would you recommend to drink an un oak Chardonnay in? Oops. Mm. Are we talking pure wine or? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, on Oak Chardonnay, I would suggest um, our um, Sauvignon glass. Yeah. Um, traditionally, that, that's what I like to drink it out of. Um, and I just find that, you know, sort of traps. Um, and it is on oak. So generally speaking for me, like an on oak is, you know, a little bit lighter. In yeah. My it's an aromatic wine. Yeah, it's more <laughs> aromatic. Yeah. So that would be my my personal choice. And I think you guys have that on hand, do you not? We do, and that's what we use those for. Um, yeah. So we, we treat an unoak Chardonnay just like we would a Sauvignon Blanc or a Yes, Rousse. yes. It is aromatic, mm. you know, uh, it has a lot of fresh fruit aroma. You wanna keep that freshness, so. Exactly, and trap that to, sort of in the glass. Yeah, you don't wanna treat it like a Chardonnay, like no. an oak Chardonnay, so. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah, we have another Meritage question. Um, someone, Joanne's asking if it requires a specific percentage for the blend of grapes for the Meritage. Um, I think it's, mo I could be wrong actually. We make it every year and I don't have these memorized, but um, uh, the just of varietals. So, um, so the varietals are allowed to be Cab Sauve, uh, Cab Franc, Merlot, and Petit Verdot. And I think um, for labeling as heritage, I don't know if there are any percentage requirements. Paul? No, I don't think so. I don't think no, so. no, there's no percentage requirements. And we're also allowed Malbec if we happen to go. Yeah. Oh, right, Malbec. <laughs> yeah. 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 I thought you couldn't have more than 70% of a single varietal, but I don't, that's, no. I don't know. No, you're thinking yeah, the, think. to, to call something call it like a single varietal but yeah no yeah and it's it's, it's interesting because I, I like that it changes every year and what you think it's going to be probably doesn't end up being that does it going into your blending no. it never is it never is we usually go into the blending with an idea you know like um for volumes or tank space it would make sense for this but you you don't end up making something to be easy, you end up making it because it tastes good, so. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, when was this bottled, do you know? This would have been bottled 2017, so it would have been in oak until, probably would have been bottled at the beginning of summer 2019, I would say. Usually about just almost two years before we bottled the Bordeaux, usually. Um, it's delightful. It is. It's tasting really good. Uh, so yeah. So Nathan said there's no, absolutely no nose in the plastic glass or glass. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, Diana, which glass would you recommend for Syrah? Um, well, again, I mean, I'm not a sommelier and I'm not a winemaker, but I would choose the, um, this plastic. For a straw, I think it just it needs to open up and breathe. Um, so that would be my choice. Would That's you agree? What I use. <laughs> That's what I would use. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And straw is a little bit different because it can be it changes a lot. So, but yeah, mm -hmm. I think I would go with the, with the with the burgundy glass myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jen, is there more, some, some more questions? Yeah, actually, uh, Peter is saying, uh, I have an idea. Can you run a dinner to compare Taz wine versus Redstone wine? As an example, take a Taz Meritage versus Redstone Meritage compare and contrast. And he Absolutely. says he'll have more tickets. Absolutely, Peter. We, uh, we're, we're anxious to get back to doing our dinners and whatnot. So oh. I, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> um, great idea. Simon's asking, how long would you decant this wine for? 
Myself, personally, um, you don't need to decant a wine more than 30 minutes, generally. Uh, decanting is, is, there's a couple of reasons why you would decant. So in this case, it would just be more to soften the tannins a little bit. The tannins aren't harsh, in my opinion. I don't think that decanting would really do a whole lot for this wine. Like it, 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 It's not going to hurt and jump in and, and in your opinion too, Jess and Jen, but uh, um, I don't think I it's think like For decanting for this wine, this glass actually does a really good job of decanting mm -hmm. in itself. Mm -hmm. um, the glass gives a, a decent amount of oxygen and I think the purpose of decanting would either be, you know, aesthetic because it looks nice in the, in the bottle or, um, or sorry, in the, in the decanter. Um, to pull it off of its sediment, which this wine isn't really old enough to have any sediment, um, or or for oxygen. And I think this this glass is doing a really great job of integrating a little bit of oxygen into the wine, especially being a younger cab. Um, you would expect it to be a little bit more tannic and a little bit rougher around the edges, but I think this glass really softens it. Yeah, it does for sure. But if you have if you have a wine that is still pretty young and uh, would have you know, benefited a little bit from, from more more time in the bottle, then yeah, decant half an hour is really all you need. It's not really much more than that. Um, I opened my bottle half an hour before. I didn't even decant it. I just opened it half an hour before. Um, and Claudio, you missed the answer about the Syrah. We've all said the Burgundy, the bigger of the glasses would be the one that we use. Um, but, but I agree with what uh, Jess said. I like, sometimes I just, put a wine in a decanter just because I like to use the decanter. Mm -hmm. When it's, we used to be able to have dinner parties, <laughs> it, it looks really good. It looks really great yeah. in, the, in the decanter. And there's nothing wrong with doing that either. Sometimes no, I decant the wine just because mm -hmm. it looks nice. Yes. I put Chardonnay in the decanter sometimes too, just, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, cause it, it is a, it's a, it's a oak aged wine and it will, the, the oxygen will hurt it, you know, uh, so. Yeah, do we have some, we have a bunch of do we have some comments and questions? Yeah. Um, just on the decanting, I've actually been with the sparkling wine producer who decanted their sparkling wine. So really, um, yeah, That's at Benjamin Bridge in Nova Scotia, it was a 2007 bottle, and I was there in 2018. So 11 year old sparkling, and he decanted it. So you really can decant just about anything if you really want to. Um, Joanne's asking about the prices of the wines. Uh, I can speak to the Redstone, which is $40.15 with the bottle deposit for the Cabernet Franc and $46.15 for the Meritage with the bottle deposit included. And Vicki? Robin's Block is $45.15 and the Carly's is $32.15. All right. And Kathy wants to know how long you could sell her this Meritage for. How long we've we been selling the rest of Meritage? No, Just... seller. How long could you keep oh, it? seller. I said seller. <laughs> um, I would personally say easily 10 years. So 2027 at least. But... Jess? What? Yeah, I would, I would say the same for sure. 10 to 12 years, it'll be drinking like perfectly, I think. Yeah. Meritage has a lot of potential to age for a long time. It has, you know, and... and and just to kind of speak to that briefly, when you're looking to age a wine, there are a few factors that you want to consider before you put something down. Not all wine ages, by no means, but you want you want to find a wine that has good acid structure. You want to have wine that has some good fruit characteristics, some good flavor aromas, a flavor and aromas, and you want. Um, um, it was one other thing I was going to say, and I forgot what it was. <laughs> Nicely balanced wine. If it's if it's too like too tannic or not tannic enough, or you know, it needs to be nice and balanced. And that wine has a lot more potential to age and turn into something enjoyable down the road. Today will be a good test too, because if if everyone um, you know kind of holds on to their bottle and over mm -hmm. the course of a few hours sips on it and sees how it kind of changes in the glass and how it kind of changes over time. Um, if you're willing to hold on to it for a few hours, <laughs> yeah. um, but yeah, drink it, drink it over a few hours and you'll, and you'll watch it develop. And, um, 
you know, if it's just really tasting good at the beginning and then the flavors kind of die away over time uh, and, you know, in, in an hour, the wine is kind of feeling a little bit tired, then maybe that wouldn't be something that you're looking to age. But if throughout the evening, the wine is getting more complex and developing different layers of flavors, um, then that's definitely something that you, you might want to grab another bottle and hold on to it and drink it a few years down the line. Yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, comments too, Jen. Yeah, um, Darren's asking if there's different decanters for different wines, because there are a million different styles of decanters. Mm -hmm. um, da Diana, do you guys, I know that Riedel sells specific Merlot decanters and stuff like that, but I'm not sure how much I really buy into that. I don't know that I do either. I mean, we have a variety of decanters and I, I think, you know, obviously um, the opening plays a big part. And then the, obviously because of the travel time, but, you know, I think decanters overall, generally speaking, are sold based on books. And Absolutely. They're aesthetics. Yeah, it's all yeah. aesthetics, optics, and really, I think, depends on, you know, your preference and, you know, what you're looking for. So, uh, so just to tag on to what Diana saying, so if you, it depends on why you want to decant. So it's not necessarily right. decanting for a certain varietal. It's the reason why you're decanting. Right. If you are, if you are decanting a wine that's young or super tannic and it needs to be soft, you want to get one of the, the decanters. Wider bowl. Mm -hmm. bottle. Because that, because that whole, and the reason for that shape is that the top of the wine has all that surface uh, exposure to the oxygen uh, but if you're and it's also good for if you're if you're decanting a wine because it's cold and you want to trap the sediment it's mm -hmm. a really good you want that that shape too because it will help separate the sediment so it's not getting into your glass uh, I have some of those smaller ones that are, you know um, a quick little 30 minute just freshen up the wine or whatever so it's really the reason why you're decanting we used to sell those crazy $800 Riedel mm. pieces of art. Do you remember those, Jess? Oh, yeah. they scared me. I've always I wanted Cobra. Yeah. Oh, they scared I, me. I so was much. scared to go near them, to be honest. I know. <laughs> you know, kids would be running around the retail store and I'd be like, Ooh. yeah. <laughs> they, yeah, I was glad when they were all gone. Woo, they made me nervous. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, Paul sends his apologies. He just texts me. He's, he's he's he can't get back on now, so he, he's very sorry. He's at his cottage because he's doing kitchen renos at his house. So uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, any uh, questions or comments, uh, Jen? Yeah, absolutely. There's more. Uh, lots more actually. Um, for the Redstone and Taz people from Jacqueline, what is our favorite wine from each of the properties? Ooh. I know that's a fun one. <laughs> just you want to start. Yeah. Favorite wines from each of the properties. Um, for, so, oh, it's a tough one. Okay, Quarry, uh, Quarry Road, I think the the Riesling and the Chardonnay are definitely my favorite. I, I don't think that I could narrow it down between the two. Um, for Taz, uh, the Cherry Pinot is, is definitely my favorite. Um, Redstone, I think the Syrah is very unique. Um, and I'd like to see where the Semillon goes. Yeah. We'll see. Very, very tiny block of that. Um, and then our limestone vineyard, uh, I mean, it's it's predominant really Riesling, and I think that's for a good reason. Um, but we also did, we were, we're going to be planting some Cab Franc down there, so I'd be really interested to see where yeah. that goes. See you in four years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Right. One of your favorites. I have a sentimental, well, I'm sparkling wine all the time anyways, but sentimentally, I have an affinity to the 2016 Rosé Spark um, because it was the first bottle I ever bought from Redstone and it was before I worked here and I celebrated and my delicious. job with it. And it was very good. Um, but was it 2016 wines, from Limestone? Yeah, uh, yeah, it was the rosé uh, a couple of years ago. It was beautiful. And for reds, I would probably say the 2015 Meritage. I really enjoyed it. It was a 50 Merlot with 25 Cab Franc and 25 Cab Sauve. And a cooler year, which I actually like with my reds. Get a little more 
of the, I don't know, it just doesn't seem overly fruit forward to me. And that's how I kind of like my reds. And your favorite Taz wine? Favorite Taz wine. Well, um, there's so many. <laughs> there's so many. I know it's I know it's an easy one, and but I really like the Riesling Spark. It's delicious. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. I'm anyone who knows me knows I love Riesling, and my Instagram handle is everything for a Riesling. <laughs> so I, yeah, I would say probably the Riesling Spark just for fun. Mm -hmm. I think for me, I think for me, my favorite Redstone wine. I, I the Red Syrahs. Um, the 2010 Redstone was, Syrah was probably my favorite. Uh, I love the Syrahs. And I am in, in loving the 17 Cap Franc right now. Though, like, I love Cap Franc. It's just, yeah. Um, Taz, current favorite wine is the 2014 David's Block Sparkling. Because I'm like Jen, sparkling is my jam. So <laughs> I love it very much. Uh, historical favorite 2012 Van Bears Cap Franc is my historical probably best favorite wine we ever made uh yeah but I'm loving all of our sparklings we have a great sparkling program uh Jess and the team are doing an amazing job with those and uh, we have amazing sparkling glasses that from this line which are <laughs> super fancy and I love them I have them at home I'm obsessed <laughs> I do too yeah I do too That's they just cool. really I think they really, um, they're so showy, but not in like an overly showy kind of way. Every single person, when I used to be able to have people over, would be yeah. like blown away by those gorgeous glasses. Yeah, because they're nice and tall mm -hmm. and just sleek. Do you want to speak about the etching in the bottom of them, Diana? Mm, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the etching is designed, obviously, to sort of, you know, aerate the actual... Uh, bubbly itself and sort of bring those notes to the surface um, and they're not in every flute and champagne glass so they're only a select few. There's no bubbles in here though. <laughs> What's that? Only an empty glass. That's a fail. <laughs> Sorry I, I, I missed that. What did you say? I said she brought me an empty glass. Uh, oh my gosh. They're, they're showing the spark balls but they're awesome. Yeah, they're beautiful. They're very, very popular. And I think someone was asking about how the sets are sold. So we traditionally, um, we do, um, I think you buy and yeah, hospitality. So every, all of our glasses are packed in six, um, regardless of the stem. It's just how we package to food service. You can actually purchase um, our retail packs. They have pretty packaging. They're not corrugated cardboard, but they cost more money. And, you know, you can get twos and fours. And, you know, I think everyone just wants the glass. They don't care how it arrives as long as it's not broken. So essentially, you know, you'll save money that way. And, you know, you'll have more glass. People were asking if they can buy more at this event price, and they can. So if you, if you want to buy any more sets of these glasses we're having today, uh, just uh, let Jen know. J. Carter at redstonewines.ca and she'll take care of you. Yeah, you're more than welcome to buy because it because it is a discounted price. But yeah. uh, and we can't we do sell these. If you just want to buy one glass, you can buy just one glass. You don't have to buy it and just in normal times, so you don't have to buy this like six or whatever. So they're very um fun. next we have a shout out from Vera. She wants to say happy 30th anniversary to Claudio and Lydia. I know they're both on here and Happy birthday! Oh, anniversary. I need bubbles! <laughs> yeah, we should have some bubbles to celebrate their anniversary. Yes. Um, next, uh, what else do we have? Uh, Nathan's asking, I believe Taz is biodynamic, is redstone as well. Mm. So yes. Tess, do you want to handle that one? Um, yeah, so ta both Taz and Redstone share the same vineyard practices. So we are not certified biodynamic, but we do still uh, practice biodynamic uh, viticulture in, in both of the vineyards. So our vineyard managers, um, the same as our winemaking team, are the same team, and all of the vineyard practices are the, are the same. So we were, so we are, we're still, we're, we're still certified organic and we were certified biodynamic until a couple, a couple years ago. Yeah. Year. And to, I think the 2017s were the last, um, 
2017 or 2018 was the last cryogenemic um, year at Taz, and we were just finding it a little bit limiting in terms of um, adding back to the soil. We weren't able to um, fertilize with um, chicken manure. Uh, what we were, yeah, it was chicken manure, um, but we, we weren't able to use specific manures, um, and we were finding the vineyards were um, not quite producing as we were hoping, and they didn't look as healthy as we were hoping. Um, so we dropped the certification um, just to try and get the vineyards back up to really good health. But we're still farming them mm -hmm. that yep. way. We just, we're, we're now, we just have a little bit more flexibility with what we want to do. We're not, doesn't mean we're going to you know, be using uh, synthetic stuff because we're, we're still certified organic. Just, nope. We made yeah, the decision for what was and, better for our vineyards. Yeah, and both both Redstone and Taz are still certified biodynamic vineyards. And um, yeah, so we we just needed to change it up a little bit, and we didn't we didn't want to make any sacrifices to the vineyard um, just in the name of having having a certification on the bottle. So, all right, um, Karen's asking what to eat with the Meritage. Personally, like a nice big steak, but yeah, <laughs> protein, protein, protein. <laughs> Yeah, which is hard when you're a vegetarian, but anything, you know, uh, when you think vegetarian wise, you know, anything with uh, lots of mushrooms or, you know, mushrooms, yeah, yeah fat, so fatty, you want, you want, when you have a big bowl of bread like this, um, you want fatty to, which will, which will withstand the tannins, the acidity, it's, it's there. Uh, so the wine won't empower the food and the food won't overpower the wine. You want to find that nice balance. Uh, Jess, what would you eat with this? Anything with caramelized onions incorporated, I think, would be really nice. <laughs> the sweetness of the onions and and the tannin, and yeah, I find I find the wine right now is really like rich and um, I don't know, kind of um, earthy. So I mm. think it would go well with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got a bunch of other questions here. Um, <laughs> Kathy's asking if we can comment about microwaving wine for a short time, three to eight seconds to age it. That's not something I've ever heard of. I don't no, know. No, I've never heard else. of that. I don't recommend it either. I would try it, but I wouldn't personally recommend it. <laughs> Just um, especially in smaller volumes, when you when you put wine into the microwave, it can really, really, really quickly boil. Like probably in 30 seconds, you could boil a glass of wine. Um, <laughs> And, and what you're kind of doing and heating it up is blowing off the alcohol, blowing right. off the aromatics. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, you don't, you don't want any, any ever do you want a drastic temperature change. Even though you're only doing it for a few seconds, that the, the temperature is going to change. You don't, you don't want to expose your wine to, to drastic temperature change. You want it to be consistent as much as possible. All right. Uh, Steve Kangas is asking where the limestone block is. Uh, the limestone block is actually um, up on the escarpment right next to Flat Rock Cellars. So it's actually on 19th Street in Jordan, um, 19th and 7th, I believe, is the corner, I believe. Okay. Um, Nathan's asking if there's any plans to try affecting a small batch of the semillon with Botrytis, a Canadian Sauternes style, perhaps. Um, Botrytis is a tricky one because it's very vintage dependent and you need very, very specific uh, growing conditions. So it actually really depends on the weather of the year. If it's too humid, um, you might just end up with mold. So it's quite, it's quite risky. Um, in 2020, we actually did have a little bit of Botrytis in the Semillon um, just by fluke, just accidentally we did. Um, and it ended up turning into a really, really delicious wine. It, um, the whole batch is in the uh, Redstone White Meritage in 2020. So look forward to that one. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it's really de vintage dependent. If if we stumbled upon the perfect amount of botrytis, um, we would certainly go for it. Yeah. Uh, Joanne says that they live in Annapolis and since we're all sparkling lovers that we should go visit for their sparklings. She's not yeah. wrong. Benjamin Bridge, yeah. Lackety. Sparkling, sparkling and cider, too. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of great stuff in, in Annapolis. There's I went a few years ago. It was actually one of the best wine trips that I've done. Oh, fun. 
Uh, Dale has something on in the chat. It says, what are your thoughts on air ra rations of breads? Air oh, aeration. Do you mean aeration? Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> air ration. I personally am not a fan of the aeration. You mean like putting the aerator in the, the bottle and pour it? It's supposed to expedite the decanting process. For me, I, I don't think it's necessary. I, if you need to decant something, I'd rather just put it in a decanter for 30 minutes. Um, it's a little more harsh on the wine. Um, and I, I, I think they're more of a gimmick. They're than anything. I think just throw it in a decanter for 30 minutes. That's my thought. Mm -hmm. um, and Jen, what do you guys think? Um, yeah, I I've never been a fan of aerators. My friends have bought them for me before and they honestly sit in the box and I've never touched them. Yeah. Um, if I open anything that needs an extra little bit of air, I am a bit of a nerd that way. I just plan ahead and I throw it yeah. in the decanter a little early. I've been known to decant wines up to four or five hours early, depending on what they are and what they need. And <laughs> it just takes planning. It's just not the bottle that you open right away. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, Jess? I have never used an aerator, but I also don't have one. Um, maybe if I was gifted it, I would I would give it a shot. <laughs> but I think um, I think that maybe it's overthinking the wine a little bit too much and overthinking the process. Um, if I had a glass of wine that I think that I thought needed a little bit of air, I would probably either decant or to be honest, I don't decant that much. I would just, um, just let it air in air in the glass and, you know, pour a smaller volume in, into my glass and, um, give it a swirl and yeah, swirl incorporate oxygen that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. We have two people, uh, both AJ and Claudio asking about Flutes versus the wider champagne style glasses. So the coupes versus the actual champagne glass. So there's actually three or four yeah. different styles now. Diana, Is thoughts there... on, on? All right. What was sorry? What was the question? So basically, that. what are your thoughts on using a flute for sparkling as opposed to like a coupe or mm -hmm. something or the else? Champagne glass. So I mean, again, I think this is really trend driven in terms of bubbly. So, you know, as with anything, it's all very cyclical and these coupes seem to be making a way back into the industry and they seem to be a fan favorite. Like I personally think, I mean, unless you're gonna chug your, your bubbly, um, it's maybe not my personal choice. Like I, I, I would rather sip and sort of encourage, you know, um, yeah. the bubbly to just sort of remain as is, but this really opens up, you know, the wine and it's, you know, but it is very, very popular. So it is, it is. I've been, I've been known, uh, I have the, our coupe glasses, the pure coupe mm -hmm. glasses for, we use for our cocktails. And once in a while when I'm just feeling a little mm -hmm. whimsical, I'll, I'll right. put it in there. And this is the old Marie Antoinette kind of, you know. It is, yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is the best thing for your sparkling yeah. wine. Mm -hmm. it's, you're going to you're going to keep the carbonation longer. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to direct the fizz. Mm -hmm. It should be tickling your nose, right? <laughs> I would absolutely agree. Like I find it just go either in the glass type or the coupe, just goes right. flat real quickly. Really whereas fast. the flute, mm -hmm. you keep that bubble. And if you're going to spend the money on a champagne or a nice sparkling wine, you want to keep the bubble <laughs> there. Like that's right. this is fun. just. This is, this is festive. This is a special, this is a, like an occasion yeah. glass. So, you know, when you're drinking from this glass, it's special. What are your thoughts, Jess? Um, sorry, I was reading through some of the questions. Were we talking <laughs> about uh, sparkling in different glassware? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, personally, I would drink sparkling out of either the flute or if I was looking for a little bit more oxygen, something like the aromatic yeah. um, glassware. Um, I think that if you were purchasing a bottle of sparkling, not necessarily to overanalyze it and really look at it and have it in your glass for a long time, you could put it in something like a coupe, um, you know, something really quaffable that it's you're fine. just, uh, yeah. not to say knocking back, but something yeah. that you just intend on drinking, not thinking too much about, um, and drinking within a, a decent amount of time to be able to sip it out of the coupe quickly. I just think that in the coupe, um, you're going to lose most of the carbonation pretty quickly. 
That's true. Although it is beautiful, isn't it? It, it is. is fun, though. It is super fun. fun. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, there's a there's a comment in the chat from Lara Lamalgo. Sorry, Blair says, "I love the Meritage. Thank you for taking time out of your Sunday to share with us. You're very welcome." I have a question, please. I have been loving Pinot Noirs, especially from Taz and the Escarpment in general. What years should I be looking out for when it comes to Pinot Noirs from the Escarpment region? Um. Personally, for me, I think that Pinot does really well in the cooler years. Um, I would say 2013, if you can still get your hands on the 2013s, they are to die for. Very, very delicious. Um, all of the 13s from Taz that I'm drinking right now are like in the perfect place for drinking. Um, so, so yeah, that cooler kind of vintage, you know, like a warmer growing season maybe, but, um, nothing, no, nothing overly warm. Mm -hmm. I think the 2016s are quite a warm vintage, um, 20, 2013 and 2015 as recent vintages would be really, really nice. Um, I, I like 20, the 17s too for the peanut. Yeah, the 20, I was just going to say the 2017s yeah. are really nice as well. So, um, yeah, the, every other vintage, the 13, the 15 and the yeah. 17. <laughs> But keep, uh, stay tuned for the 2020s because we have some pretty high expectations for those. We're mm -hmm. planning to do a Pinot preview, which I haven't done in a few years because they are going to be amazing, and but not as much of it. The, yield, the yields are lower, correct, Jess, for 2020? We had very low yields in 2020, uh, but the fruit quality was just uh, out of this world. It was really unbelievable. So... Um, not to say that other years aren't good. We just end up usually doing, especially for Pinot Noir, a little bit more hand sorting uh, with the fruit. But in 2020, we received them in like pristine condition. So yeah. And I think like the skins weren't too thick. It was a warm vintage and a warm summer, but we didn't get those really heavy thick skins. So the tannins are really, um, really lush and not, not overly um, overpowering. So yeah, they'll be really nice wines. Stay tuned. Some more chat. What glass for California Zin? Definitely, I would use the Mer the Bordeaux glass for the California Zin. Um, and for Chianti, I would I would use the Cabernet glass. Me yeah. too. I think so. Um, I have a question about what wines are good in stemless glasses. Mm, something you're going to drink fast. Yeah, I it's my just sit at home and have a drink casual. Yeah. Because this is why it's this versus this. So mm -hmm. um, your hand will warm up the wine. So, I mean, if you're not being too fancy or fussy, you know, anything, anything. There's, there are different shaped ones. So uh, here we actually buy the Bordeaux stemless glasses, but we use them for the water. <laughs> we use them for water. Actually, we do a redstone too. Um, and we have the rocks glasses for both. But... Um, but you can, you can, it's just, maybe just try not to keep your hand on it too much. On the glass, yeah. 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 I, um, I use stemless for a, a lot of, a lot of things when I probably shouldn't, but I think something that you would put in the fridge that doesn't need to be that really crisp refrigerator yeah. temperature, like Chardonnay is a perfect example. You kind of want to drink it a little bit warmer than fridge temperature. Sure. So if you were to put your Chardonnay in a, in a stemless glass and, uh, not really hold on to it for too long. It would probably end up being the perfect temperature or any any reds really that you don't plan mm -hmm. on hold, holding on to it. It's just, yeah, you re don't really want it to be the same temperature as your body if you're holding on to it for too long. That's true. All right, next, uh, Karen says, white meritage, question mark. Tell me more. <laughs> yeah. So Jess, do you want to go into the white meritage at all? Yeah, so 2020 was the first time we've done a white marriage, I think, I think since 2012. So it's been about eight years. Um, and the white meritage is a blend of Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon from the, uh, the Semillon is from the Redstone Vineyard. Um, and yeah, it's really nice. We, we almost did a single Vineyard Semillon and then we tried it with the, with the Sauvignon Blanc and, and it was undeniably good. So, um, yeah, really juicy, uh, nice, nice minerality. We did a little bit of lee stirring as well. So it kind of gets a little bit of that, um, that yeasty flavor um but yeah mostly mostly tropical fruit so it's a really nice wine 
Oh. It's called White Meritage because Sauvignon Blanc and Samso are uh, indigenous. They originally come from Bordeaux. So it's the same as the Meritage. The Red Meritage is the same story for the White Meritage. It's only those two that are um, in a White Meritage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, we put it in a Bordeaux bottle as well. Back to yes. speaking about Bordeaux. Yeah, that's right. I have someone asking why the yield was less in 2020. Um, that's a good question. Let me think back to 2020. The yields were a little bit lower, I think, mostly because it was such a warm, dry year. So we it was a little bit on the um, like kind of close to drought kind of years. The berries were really quite small, um, and we we didn't have a lot of rain. Um, and we we were planning for a heavier vintage, so we we um where we were hoping for a heavier vintage, we cropped uh, rather low. And then and then with the dry season, we, we didn't end up with as much fruit uh, as we would have hoped for. Um, but I think in, in a lot of years that, that just ends up concentrating the fruit and, and kind of giving you uh, the really good quality, so. There's a question in the chat. It says, would you consider continu- continuing this sort of virtual tasting when the pandemic is over? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, because we all can't come to the winery. A lot of us live all over the place. So absolutely. Um, I'm not sure who asked this, but someone's asking, is it available yet? And I think they're asking about the white meritage. And just uh it will be a wine club wine. Uh so it will be released to our wine club in October. And then after that, if there's any left, we're yeah. willing to share for sure. <laughs> But um, it goes out to them first, so it'll be released later this year. That's another comment. This virtual event is fabulous for those of us outside of the Niagara region. More, please. Okay. Um, We hear you. (laughs) uh, Another question in the chat is, uh, any comments on Chardonnay's room temperature versus chilled? Mm, Slightly chilled. Yeah, you don't want your you don't want your Chardonnay to be as cold as you want your Riesling, but you don't want it to be room temperature either. If it's too warm, you're just going to taste the alcohol. If it's too cold, you're not going to taste anything or smell anything. So, uh, slightly warmer for Chardonnay. All right. And what class would you use for Semillon? Same as the aromatic, same as the Sauvignon Blanc or the Pinot Gris or a Riesling, because it's an aromatic. So just Basically, think any white wine that hasn't been oak aged or isn't super sweet, they're all pretty much in the same category as far as glass bear. Perfect. All right. And that's all the questions I have here. Um, wait, I just saw one. Yeah, Raiders came with, Oh, wait, something. Oh, something about. Oh, hold on. Uh, where'd it go? How does drinking out of the change the taste? We just talked about that the other day, Jen and I, because we do sell the, those stainless steel tumblers in both of, our, both of the retail stores, because they're great if you're at the cottage. I have personally taken glasses of wine in the canoe with, or in the, in the uh, kayak with me in the tumblers, because they have a lid. Um, you get a bit of a metallic, you'll get a little bit of a metallic taste to it. But I mean, when I'm when you're out in the kayak or sitting on your dock, you don't you're not really that worried about <laughs> <laughs> the wine tasting is <laughs> perfect. Uh, what do you think, Jen? You you use them quite a bit. I mean, the similar glasses I use for everything. Um, when it comes to the differences between the different glassware, I don't. No, she's talking about uh, the stainless, the stainless oh, tumbler. The stainless? Oh, stainless. Oh, the stainless tumbler. Sorry, I was reading something else in the chat um the stainless tumblers i i find you do get a little bit of that metallic Mm -hmm. note sort of like you're drinking a pop out of a can versus out of a glass Mm -hmm. but if you're just sitting on a beach drinking a glass of wine as long as it's cold yeah not gonna last in my glass yeah so the stainless the stainless is about convenience it keeps it cold it's got a lid on it you know Mm -hmm. you know um, Kelly asked if Taz is selling more sets of more sets or individual glasses. Um, we don't usually sell full sets because because the sets, as Diana mentioned earlier, we buy them in boxes of six. 
Um, people will often buy like four, four of a glass. Yeah. But that's the nice thing about, about these is you can buy, you can buy one if you want. Mm -hmm. um, um, Karen asked if I would send out a list of what goes in what glass when I send out the information and absolutely yeah. I'll do that. How many people participated today? We had 81 total, I think. Um, 77, including all the panelists, actually logged on. And so, like, and I, so 77, and that's like couples. Yeah. So, couples, so a lot. Yeah, <laughs> some, some people had more than just their couple at their homes. So yeah, there's a lot of people that were interested in being here today, and we're really happy that everyone did join us. There was one couple that almost didn't get to because they yeah. didn't glasses but uh my lovely violette got them to you guys so i'm glad you were able to make it Aww. owen celebrating our 38th via the tasting oh that's nice wow. Aww. happy that's anniversary so happy anniversary once again we need sparkling wine in our glasses <laughs> <laughs> how will we ever host another event without sparkling We'll just need to be prepared for every well, situation. I've never, this is the first time I've ever done an event for work where I haven't been drinking sparkling already. Because usually oh, wow. it's, <laughs> it's the usually opener it's, and the it's the opener and it's the closer. Yeah. Uh thank you so much. So informative coming to when you open. Yes, stay tuned for our opening plans. There's a nice little comment. Delighted to see four ladies holding down the fort. Mm -hmm. and then <laughs> well, at Taza and Redstone, we are very um, female oriented. There's most of the management at Taz and Redstone are women. From the winemaker to the vineyard manager to sales director. Uh, yeah, we got lots of women. <laughs> Paul is very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and there's lots of comments about a sparkling event. Mm -hmm. And we've done sparkling events in the past, and uh, uh, I'm open for that. I, I did well a, couple, a few years ago. I guess uh, time is starting to blur now, but I think it was maybe three years ago. I I was doing some wine education series, and we did one because at Taz we're lucky enough we have our own Taz and Redstone, our own disgorging line. So we actually most most wineries have to take their sparkling wine get them disgorged uh, and disgorging the process of popping out the the yeast plug and topping it up and putting the cork in and we did we did an event at the disgorging line so people could actually see it because it's it's a part of the winemaking process that very few people get to see so i would love to do that again uh it's a lot of fun that'd be really cool oh it was, it was great and we can do we can maybe just we could do some like massage trials so people can try the different sweetnesses and totally um yeah kim said will you review the questions on answer for future considerations have we gone through all the questions do you think jen i think we have but there they will also be included i think with the recording i think i'm not sure i'll have to check on that but yes we can definitely look at that blair i'll make sure that the invitations are sent out for the pinot preview definitely i i think that'll be fun um to follow up on the bubbly glassware, would you use different glassware for different sparkling bridles? No. No. This one's fine. Bubbles are bubbles. Yeah. Bubbles are bubbles. Yeah. Um, stemless glass. The stemless glass Taz whiskey is the best. Yeah, we've got some good um, We have our logoed ones, but those are just generic. But we have the um, rocks glasses that are part of the pure line. I think I think the favorite my favorite glass that we carry is our is the coupe. I love the coupe, which is part of the same line. Oh, I love it. The cocktail coupe. Oh, mm -hmm. it's so good. I love it. It's glass. quite nice. Yeah. It's so pretty. Uh, uh, Karen's asking if there's other glasses from this line that she should add to her, her collection. <laughs> there's a ton in this yeah. line. Yeah, Diana, how many other what other glasses are in this line? We don't oh, make it is. There, um, are, if we're talking just stemmed, I think in total there's about uh, maybe 20. 
And then we have maybe another dozen or so in the um, stemless collection in pure. So it was quite a, a selection. Yeah. There's a lot, it's a lot, yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, we carry more at Stone uh, than we do here at Taz. Um, I just tried to keep it a little more simple, but yeah. um, the, the funny thing is when we switched, um, these, the Bordeaux glasses, they don't fit underneath our tasting bar, which I didn't oh. know until they arrived. <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> sorry. Oh. They're in the store they do, but in the cellar three, they don't, which is funny. Right. So like, that's fine. We just keep them in racks. It's hilarious, but they're quite right. tall. Yeah. Um, but we just, we just love them. They're great glasses. Thank you. Do you have a coupe near you, Vicki? What's that? Do you have a coupe near you? Someone's asking if we can show yep. it. Yep. Oh, I could maybe get an image. Oh, you've got the actual glass. Yeah. Yeah. So, Jen, if you were to drink a mimosa, would it be out of the sparkling glass or the aromatic glass? Uh, mimosa? Sparkling or aromatic? Yeah, probably the aromatic. Mm -hmm. Bigger, it holds more. I know, I was just looking exactly. at it thinking, I wonder if this would be better for a mimosa. I always do it in the sparkling glass, but I was thinking, and the oh. hard thing about putting a mimosa in the sparkling glass, it, it's nice because you get that kind of separation visually, but then it doesn't mix very well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah I'm thinking I, aromatic. I, when it comes to mimosas, it's volume. So like, yes, I might even agreed. go with the cab glass. <laughs> I usually okay. run out of, I usually run out of, um, of room for orange juice to be honest. I'm, I'm doing well, a fast I only add enough orange juice for color. So. Color, yeah. <laughs> I'm doing a fast. Are you ready for the fashion show? Oh my yeah. goodness, this is hilarious. <laughs> okay. So this is this is the stemless Bordeaux that we use for wa water at the taste bar. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And then this is our rocks glass that we, we just it's a little dusty. Yeah. Kill store's a little <laughs> dusty because nobody's in it right now. So, uh, which is great for like whiskey, whatever. Mm. We use those at home for whiskey, water, cocktails, mm. gin and tonics, yeah. everything. This is the grappa glass. So for the La Pressatura, I, I love this glass. It's so fun. Mm -hmm. So very specific just to grappa, which is oh. really fun. Oh, well, that's the hard one. And then my favorite, the coupe. Mm -hmm. So that old fashioned right. cocktail glass that I do occasionally when I'm feeling fancy, drink sparkling out of. <laughs> I was using the tall highball glass last night for a oh, blueberry yeah. cocktail. So that's another one that we've had right. around here. Yeah. The restaurant so uses it for beer. Yeah, Redstone has some different ones. So restaurant uh, Redstone had these glasses first. I actually picked these up for when we were opening the restaurant and then so yeah, they've got the, the highballs and um, so Redstone has the Beaujolais glass, which is similar to yeah. the Burgundy, but smaller. And we have a martini glass as well. The I think you guys as well. Yes. They're, they're, just, they're awesome. Mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're pretty reasonably priced too. So any other questions? <laughs> um, Okay, awesome job today. Thanks for hosting our son's wedding next year on, on, on our property. Okay. We'll to you about products for that day. Absolutely. Uh, you can reach out to uh, you can reach out to myself or, or Jen. We can take care of that. Yes, Claudia wants to know what you're drinking. Who? You noticed you went back to white wine, Jess. And he wants to oh. know what white wine. Oh, I, I uh, actually didn't have anywhere to tip out my, my Cab Franc. Um, so I, when I was switching back and forth between the two glasses, so I just rinsed my, my, uh, glass out and I was trying the Robin's chart again. <laughs> I actually it's, think it tastes very, um, coastal right now. I, I was just thinking like, like wow, if you didn't know this like, was from like the saline? Land of Ontario, it has like that saline kind of flavor, perfect, like oyster shell kind of aromatics right now. So anyway, just going back to that. Um, Sean's asking why the barrels behind you are wrapped in plastic icky. Oh. <laughs> the brand. Those, barrels, 
So those barrels uh, that are wrapped in plastic are brand new. Um, we didn't, because of the low yields in 2020, we didn't get to using all of the barrels that we purchased. Um, just based on our estimates, we order barrels at the very beginning of the year from France and we did not get to using those ones. So they're, they're brand new and they'll get to be used in 2021 instead. Perfect. Um, actually, Diana, uh, Ray's asking if a grappa glass would be good for cognac. Do you know anything about that? A grappa glass for cognac? Yeah. Yeah, very versatile. So again, you have the, the opening at the mouth, so it's sort of tapered and it's sort of flute. Um, all, uh, many of my accounts use the grappa, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, Someone was asking for a martini glass. I have an image here. I don't know if you guys actually have a martini there. I don't know if you could see that. Um, yeah, absolutely. I might have one here. Oh, you do? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sounds like someone's sabering over there. Having some problems. Oh. <laughs> 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 Um, do we, uh, we have oh yes, the martini. Oh, okay, so yes, yeah, so that is not. Yeah, so this this is the cognac, but uh, the mart there's an actual martini in the pure line. So again, the very angular sort of. You know, and the martini. This is yeah, it's a classic martini, beautiful. Um, and Pierre is asking what glass to use for a rosé, and I've used the aromatic. Mm -hmm. Same as Riesling or Sauvignon Blanc, this mm -hmm. little guy here. Agreed. And Rhiannon says they compared the bubbly from the coupe to the flute last night, and she preferred the flute. And is asking if the shot size or coupe is different. Um, probably not that different, just because the shape is pretty similar from coupe to coupe, but it's a really pretty style. So it is. Yeah. The pure line does it really well. I tend to reserve, like for the coops, I, I tend to reserve that for cocktails um, as opposed to bubbly. You know, that's just my preference, but it is. And Ryan, oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Mm -hmm. uh, Ryan's asking about a glass for ice wine. Oh, Vicky's making us jealous. That's what she's doing. Um, a glass for ice wine, we use the raisin glass, which is actually very similar to the aromatic white, but it's a little bit smaller. smaller. That's the one thing that the Pure Line doesn't have, is a proper ice wine glass, which I would like to see them have. Yeah, well, um... Because they're too big. Have you, have you seen the dessert wine? It's only like 10 ounces, so it's, I think it's ideal for the ice wine. Really but no? Okay, I should send that off to you. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think, yeah, I, don't, I, I can't recall what you've purchased. Like, Maybe they didn't have it when I was first looking, because I... Yeah. No, we do have a dessert wine. I think it's ideal for the ice wine, but... Mm -hmm. In case anybody's wondering, I'm drinking my favorite 14 <laughs> David's block. Owen's saying you're evil because you're showing off your sparkling. <laughs> oh. So and Ray's saying he wants the rest of your bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Laura's drinking it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions or comments? It's been awesome. Fantastic. Um, Diana, yeah. uh, it's an anonymous question. Uh, just once, or uh, Jessica, do you get asked for ID when you walk into your into a winery? You look so <laughs> useful and you're so knowledgeable. Me? You. Yeah. I celebrated my 30th birthday this year. So wow. <laughs> yes, I get ID'd every time, actually. I do. But <laughs> I, I don't know why. Because you look young. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been I've been in the industry since I was 17. So so that's that's where the knowledge comes from. <laughs> All right. And Owen's asking about a gin vodka whiskey tasting. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I want to do more of that uh, once we start. We had things like that planned, and then 
you know, COVID. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and now that we're doing more stuff and, uh, yeah, because we, we can, I want to do tastings at the still and whatnot and have Jess and the, the, the team explain more about the distillation because people don't know a lot about distillation. So it's, and it's really interesting. So, yeah, so that is all in the works <laughs> when things get back to normal. Yeah. But we just released our new baby baby gin. So we have a half bottle of gin, which is adorable. Oh, wow. So cute. <laughs> a lot of people are liking that the virtual tasting means no one has to drive home after. Right? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah never me. This should have done this at home. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Anything else? Any other questions, comments? Um, no, I think that's everything. Yeah, so, so Jen, if you want to send everybody, you know, uh, tasting notes for all the wines and, uh, you know, the things that people are asking for, um, yeah, everybody can get that. And, well, thank you very much, for, Diana, for, for joining us. I uh, really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, ladies. That was awesome. Sorry, that was so stressful. These, you know, <laughs> so, no, I mean, in terms of, like, tech and stuff like that. No, I know. And, oh, and, but everybody's used to that. You know, we're all zooming so much oh, yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, but thank you very much. We appreciate it. Uh, Diane is great. We've been working with her for oh, five years now and, and just uh, really happy with the products that we're getting from you. So thank Thanks, you very much. Thank you, ladies, for your support. Appreciate yeah, it. You're welcome. Uh, you're welcome, Colette. Thanks for joining us. So everybody, thank you very much for joining us. This is um, this was great and really enjoyable for us too. Uh, and if you have any more questions, maybe maybe we missed your question, or if you think about something afterwards, just email myself or Jen, and we'll uh, we'll get back to you. You're welcome. And uh, thanks, Jess, for taking time out. And, uh, and take care of your baby. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, yeah, time actually ended up being uh, perfectly staged around this event, so she was should it, be waking up as soon as I, as soon as just, I make out. When she first hopped on, I could hear Astrid in the background, but yeah. Yeah, she was going, mama, 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 <laughs> mama. Was like, uh, she also was having a really good time pressing every button on my computer screen and touching all the glassware. So. Oh my gosh. Of course. All right. Well, thanks everybody. So yeah. Oh, there's there's a few more things. In, uh, uh, she doesn't look thirty. Where did Jess get her education? Yeah. Jess, where did I get what? Where did you get your ed education and training? Uh, I went to Niagara College for the winemaking and viticulture program from 2009 to 20 mid 2011. So it was a two and a half year uh, winery program. Um, I did my high school co-op at Flat Rock Cellars and I worked there for three years from uh, the time I was 17 until I guess I was probably about 20 years old. And then um, I did some international um, work as well, uh, doing vintages at wineries in Australia, different parts of Australia. And then I came back and did a few um, a few stints at other Niagara wineries, um, mm. Hidden Bench uh, and uh, Jackson Triggs in Niagara on the Lake before I ended up at a thousand twenty early 2014. So, wow. yeah. There you go. Mm. Well, thanks everybody. And thanks you guys for attending. And this is awesome. And yeah, let us know if you have any questions or comments or anything and we'll get back to you. Thanks again, Diana, and we'll see you all later. Okay. Bye, ladies. Bye. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday.